All right, Bismillah. <coughs> Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk wa hubba amalin yuqarribuna ila hubbak ya arhamar rahimin. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us his love. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the love of those actions that will gain his love. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the love of um, the people that he loves, insha'Allah ta'ala. Um, so today is uh, the first class of a new series that we're starting uh, titled The Journey. Um, you know, uh, I, was, I, was, I was prepping for this for I don't know how long. And um, on the ride here, like, first of all, my kids, they just be talking about crazy stuff. So it's pretty good. I don't have to really think about what I'm going to say because they were like talking about weird stuff. And um, so it kept me entertained. But then my wife, she dropped some deep knowledge on me that I have to open with, actually. Um, right when we were pulling in, she was like, uh, you know, it's the simplest question. And I was kind of like, what you talking about? And I like, where are you coming from with this? And she was like, your, your, your series is the simplest question. But it's the deepest question, and it's the scariest question. I was like, wait, I'm, what are you talking about? She's like, where are we going? And I was like, oh my God, that's so heavy. Like, ever since we came into this world, we're all wondering that question, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? And obviously the other question is, where did we come from? And um, this class, this session that we're starting, will be based on a book by Imam Qurtubi. And um, the name of the book is At-Tadkira Fil Ahwal al Maut, The Reminder Regarding the Affairs of Death. And the reason it's called The Journey, um, I was actually having a conversation with my wife again. Ironically, she's like, why'd you call it The Journey? And I was like, well, because from our perspective, death isn't the destination. It's literally the beginning of the next journey. And it's just that part of the stage that we don't have knowledge of. And so the best example that I can give about what we're going to learn in this class is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, y'all all heard the story before, but the Prophet began his message. He went on top of that mountain. And he started to call out, Ya Sabaha, Ya Sabaha. Now this was a call to signal that there was danger. So all of the people of Banu Hashim, Banu Makhzum, all of the tribes of Mecca, they all gathered at the bottom of this mountain. And I want you to picture this. Throughout this series, we will be discussing aspects of the Akhirah. And one of the most powerful aspects of the, of the Akhirah is your ability to envision it your ability to literally close your eyes while we're talking about it and see it as if it's right in front of you. That is the way that this, this, this class is so beneficial. I think when we go through this class, I'm gonna come back to the mountain. When we go through this, the Quran becomes more alive for you. You know, like you being Tarawi and that one Ammu next to you just be like in it, you know what I mean, head bobbing. You know what I mean? Like a tear drops and you sitting there like, yo, what number are we on? You know what I mean? The reason is because the Quran paints these vivid depictions of the Akhirah. And for that person, they're absorbed in the imagery that's being presented before them in those verses. Uh, uh, and then Jahannam is being dragged forward, right? And so they're seeing that, right? And, all of these verses describing, it's like a vivid picture that's being displayed right before us. And when we go through this, we'll be able to see it. But your task is to first learn it because if you don't learn it, then you won't know what to envision, right? But then the task of regularly thinking about it is what becomes so instrumental, so powerful, so reformative of who you are. It literally shakes you to your core. And here's the deal. Like, I'm actually super nervous about this because um, it's so interesting, but it's so scary too. And it's like information I need to know, but my heart doesn't want to know it. And I don't like to talk about it. So 
to talk about jealousy and being a better Muslim and having good akhlaq, that feels good. It feels good. I leave, I'm like, yeah, that felt good. How was halakha? Oh, it felt great. Snap your fingers, right? But this is different. This is kind of like, how was halakha? It sucked. It really sucked. Why did it suck so bad? Because I feel like I, it's, it's, whew, it was heavy. Need to breathe. So it's going to be heavy. I know it's going to be heavy, but if there's one thing we can understand about remembering death, and we're going to get into this today, it's, it, it, it actually should invigorate you. And we're going to talk about that more today. So when the Prophet ﷺ is standing at the top of this mountain, he's yelling out, Ya Sabaha, Ya Sabaha. And that literally means like, yo, look out, look up. Yo, beware, be on guard. And everyone gathers at the bottom. And once everyone's there, the prophet is at the top and he's like, yo, if I told y'all that there was an army on the back of this, um, this mountain on the other side, would y'all believe me? So his, his, this is beautiful imagery because he's at the peak of the mountain so he can see what they can't see. And they're at the bottom. So their position is like, well, we can't see what you have access to. And we know you to be truthful. So you know what? If you told us there's an enemy on the other side of that mountain, we would believe you. We've never heard you lie. And we know you to be truthful. So right then when they say that, he goes, all right, I want to tell you what's on the other side of another mountain. That mountain is called life. And what's on the other side of that mountain is something serious. And that's how this whole thing began. So this class is about the other side of that mountain. This class is about everything that he could see, but we couldn't see from our vantage point. And one day we will see it because guess what? You're going to climb this mountain with life and you're going to get to the peak and you're going to leave. And the moment you leave, you'll see that everything he was saying about what was on the other side is true. It's true. It's right there. Like, man, remember he said this? Remember he said that? Remember he said this? So it's heavy. I know it's heavy, but it's going to be beautiful and it will be, it will be reformative for us. It will inspire us, inshallah ta'ala. So... What we're studying is everything on the other side of the mountain. Now, when you look at the lives of the Sahaba, who are the Sahaba? The people who lived with the Prophet ﷺ. There's one hadith that when I read it, I was like, I got to share this for today. So this, this, this person, his name is Harith bin Madik. He's walking around Medina one morning. He's walking around Medina. And the Prophet was just like an average guy in a way. He would walk through the city as well. So the prophet is walking through Medina and he bumps into Hadith. And he, you know, obviously he doesn't speak in my colloquial American upstate style of speaking, but you know, he said it in however he said it. He said, Kayf asbahta ya Haditha. How you doing this morning? What's up? How's it going this morning? Kayf asbahta ya Haditha. How you doing this morning? So Haditha was in a zone. Hadith, afwan, samihni, Hadith. He's in a zone. He goes, Asbahtu mu'minan haqqan. All right, now this is a flex. He goes, I woke up this morning as a true believer. Look, look, if you like play college ball and you met LeBron and he said, how you doing? You ain't going to be like, I woke up the, this morning the best baller there is. You're not going to flex on the best. You're not going to speak about your level high, even if you reached it because of who you're standing in front of. So he says, I woke up this morning a true believer. Now, now you got to like let that sit for a moment because he's literally in front of the Prophet Sallallahu I woke up a true believer. And the Prophet, he doesn't like back down. Like if you told LeBron, I woke up the sickest, the illest player on the court today. He's going to be like, word? <laughs> oh, for real? So the Prophet doesn't back down. He goes, he says, is this, man, they spoke so like real. He says, every statement, every word has a reality. What's the reality of what you're saying? You know what I'm saying? Like you tell wifey, I love you. She goes, what's the haqiqa, right? You know what I mean? Like what's the reality? The word is cheap. What's the reality of what you're saying? So to me, that's like, wow. Now, now what is he going to do? Well, if he was just bragging, he, he would just be like, oh, no, I was just messing around, you know. But if he was serious, then he has to say something. Now, look what he says. Let it sit as you listen to it. He says, 
azafat nafsi an dunya. He's like, I woke up this morning and my, my, my heart, my nafs is moving away from the dunya, this world. And I spend my days hungry, fasting, and my nights awake in ibadah. Now, there's, here's the part I really want you to connect to. And it's, it's, it's as if I can see before my eyes, the throne of Allah has already come forward to judge us all. Like, like this man is living it, yo. This man is like, I'm walking around and it's as if, remember last week, sorry to go to the last season, right? I know last season is over, but whatever. In our last session, we talked about the levels of as if you see Allah, worship Allah as if you see him. And we talked about the highest levels that you worship Allah in the state that it's as if you're seeing Allah. This man is walking around Medina as if he sees the arsh of Allah is already there. Like, what's up? And then he says, the next statement is heavy. He goes, He goes, and I can see the people in Jannah going to each other's cribs back and forth. Uh, houses, sorry. I can see the Ahlul Jannah going back and forth. Like, you know, you down the street, like, Makare, what's up? Yo, yo, you looking fly today, bro. What's going on? Like, they're, they're, they're just, means meeting each other, seeing each other. The most splendid gear. Like face is just shining. Yeah, subhanAllah, okay, whatever, we'll get there. We'll get there. When we talk about Jannah, let's get there. But he's seeing it. But then he goes, hold up though. That ain't all he sees. Because it's the carrot and the stick, right? Obviously. So he says, He goes, and it's as if, uh, brothers, can the first row kind of just move forward? Give me some love here. Jazakallah khair. So he says, he says, uh, he says, وَكَأَنِّي أَسْمَعُ إِوَاءُ أَهْلِ النَّارِ Carrot and the stick. He goes, and it's as if I could see, uh, I'm sorry, hear the braying or the screaming of the people of hellfire. Meaning, meaning what I'm trying to show you is that he's walking around Medina and, and it's, like, it's like he's hearing this. See, for us, we see people who live lifestyles lavish away from Allah, completely, completely living a lifestyle that is on the pathway to hellfire, and it doesn't remind us of hellfire. It's, we get jelly of it. We, uh, we get jealous of it. Like, we be, we're like, yo, dang, why did Allah give him so much? Dang, I want to I I Lambo too, right? He's on another level. It's not that the dunya is deceiving him. He's walking around seeing the akhirah in front of him. He's walking around hearing the braying of the people of hellfire. And that's his reality. That's his reality that he's living by. Now, this is what he says to the Prophet Sallallahu So now, what do you think the Prophet Sallallahu said after that? His reply, the Prophet Sallallahu he goes, Whew, Abdun, nurul iman fi qalbihi. He goes, Phew. like, you know how, see, the prophet was so beautiful, man, how he spoke. Like, you know how someone's like got their game on point and you don't even speak to them, but you speak third person. So, so he's talking to him and he goes, what's the reality of what you just said? The first person, me and you talking, yo, you think you're so good. What's the reality of that? He goes, oh, well, I'm walking around. I hear the people of Hellfire. I, I can see the people of Jannah meeting each other in their homes. And I, I, I look, it looks like the arsh of Allah is right there. And the prophet, it's as if he like just looks to the side and he goes, Abdun, man, a servant who's got nur of iman in his heart. Like he's not even talking to him anymore. It's just like, yo, yo, the servant, yo. And then he says to him, in arafta falzam. He goes, all right, you got it. You just got to hold on now. And that brings me to another point. There will be moments during this session, not tonight, not today, just the whole joint, where you feel as if you see the people of Jannah, you hear the sounds of hellfire, 
you're, 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 you're like, you know, the goosebumps. You're like, it's like you're there. And then you walk out. And then it's like, oh, dang, what happened? That's okay. That's okay. Because if we frequent these gatherings enough, and if we take what we know and start to use it regularly in our moments of muraqaba that we talked about in our last session, what's muraqaba? That meditation, that state where you just sit there and reflect, like, where's my life going? What's happening to me? That is the purpose of this session. The purpose of this session is to walk through that journey. All of us have heard the lectures of Hellfire. We've heard the lectures of the grave. We've heard that every soul shall taste death, but we don't even know what's really coming. We don't even know the order. We don't know what's next. What's the first thing I'm going to see when I'm in the grave? But the prophet has explained it in so much detail that if we start to learn it, you'll be able to picture yourself going through that. And that will be one of the most uh, spiritually motivating and reformative actions that we can do. Okay? All right. So the books we're going to be using for this class, I I've been getting a lot of messages, you know, people trying to like download the books, they want the translation of it, all that. So let me explain. So there's two books we're going to study. Um, for those of you who know my style, we just read through books together and we talk about them and we, we grow. So the first book is by a Spanish scholar, mashallah, for my, my peeps. You know, we like to represent all the cultures in our halakha, alhamdulillah. So we're going to be studying from a Spanish scholar from Andalus. His name is Imam Kurtubi from the city of Cordoba. Um, he was one of the greatest scholars we've had in our histories um, from over 700 years ago. Um, he wrote an amazing book of tafsir, but he also wrote the book called a tadkira um, and and I've shared some like links in my Instagram you can find the English of it of the abridged version and so we'll be going through that I won't be reading every single word but we'll go through the book and get the lessons from it there's another book though there's another book who was the author of the book we just finished studying who said Ghazali I ain't gonna look I ain't gonna look I ain't gonna look I ain't gonna look it's all good who was it Muhasibi. all right cool Imam Muhasibi is an early scholar, early. We're talking like 200, 300, right? Hijri. And uh, he wrote a book that I came across many years ago, and I've wanted to do it as a halakha for a long time, just never got the chance. Um, the name of the book is Tawahum, and I shared both of these on my Instagram stories. And the word Tawahum actually means to imagine. And the whole book, literally, like, he literally is just going, he's like, you're laying on the bed. Your family's around you. You saw the angel walk in. The whole book is just first person like that, right? The angel is now right there next to you. Your family can't see them, but you can. Who wrote this book? Muhasibi. So what my plan is for this session, inshallah ta'ala, is we're going to actually be using both books. And the reason we're going to do that is Imam Muhasibi style is just a walk through the akhirah. And you know why that's good for you? Because it's powerful spiritually. When you sit there, you close your eyes. I'm like, yo, close your eyes. Picture what I'm saying right now. You're laying on the bed. Your, your, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister are around you. They're crying. That stuff, it'll have you in tears, right? But there's also an element where we need to learn. Like we need to learn what the Prophet Sallallahu said about death. That's why Imam Qurtubi's book is good. So we're going to be using both of these books throughout this halakha in order for us to gain this deep knowledge of the journey of the akhirah it's the question that we all want the answer to. Where are we going? Um, and we're going to begin right now, inshallah ta'ala. All right? All right, let's begin. Bismillah rahman rahim For those who know, I kind of like, like to read the Arabic. We go through the Arabic and then um, I'll translate it, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah rahman rahim The author begins with a humble... You know, it's kind of funny. These authors, they would all, always start by hating on themselves. Sorry for this geeky stuff real quick, but whatever. يَقُولُ الْعَبْدُ الْفَقِيرِ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ He goes, this, the, 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 the poor slave says. He's talking about himself. He's not hyping himself up. He's putting himself down. He's like, and he says his whole name. He says, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says some of the attributes of Allah. And he says, the one who created us, gave us life. And then he decreed that we all must die. 
and he decreed that will be resurrected in a place of reward. And he decreed that we will be separated and then there'll be a decision between us or about us so that he can reward everyone for whatever they struggled for in this world. And then he mentions a verse of the Quran from Surah to Taha where Allah says, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَأْتِي رَبَّهُ مُجْرِمًا Whoever comes to his Lord or her Lord on that day as a criminal, فَإِنَّ لَهُ جَهَنَّمْ For this person is the hellfire. لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا They won't die in it, nor will they really live. And we'll get there. We'll discuss this throughout the halaqa. Now look what he says. Why did he write this book? What did he do? He says, فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَنْ أَكْتُبَ كِتَابًا وَجِيزًا He said, I had this idea that I wanted to write a comprehensive book. يَكُونُ تَذْكِرَةً nafsi, That it would be a reminder for myself. It will be a reminder for me. وَعَمَلًا صَالِحًا بَعْدَ مَوْتِ فِي ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ And a good action that will live after me. Yo, my man's intention was tight. Because look at us 700 years later. How many of us in this room sitting here gather, reading his words. That just means his intention was purely for the sake of Allah. He said, I wrote it. Why? What was his two reasons? Why? I want you to always have these two intentions whenever you do any action. What was reason number one? Who caught it? There you go. Number one is a reminder to yourself. You can't do anything and leave out yourself. I was talking to Yezin. He's not here right now. I was talking to Yezin this, earlier today, and we were talking about the halakha, and I was like, bro, I'm preaching to myself up there, man. I'm, I'm literally talking to myself. That's why it resonates with you, because we go through the same thing. And so I'm just preaching to myself. So the first thing you always want to do is whenever you're doing an action, you have to, it's not about what, What's, what's there for everyone else? What's there for everyone else? It's, there's a level of selfishness when it comes to akhirah that every believer must have. So why are you doing this action? He said, I wrote this book. Number one, I needed to remind myself. I know one scholar, uh, I think it was Malana Ashraf Ali Tanwi, his, his teachers asked him, can you give a talk on something you're not doing yet? So like, like uh, if like there's a sister's halakha and they're like, yo, we need you to give a, a talk on Qiyam al -Layl. And you like, Qiyam al uh, you know, prayer at night. you like, um, I, I ain't, I've been sleeping on my Qiyam al I get my Fajr, but I don't get my Qiyam al So Ma Ashraf Ali Tanwi, he goes, nah, I give talks on what I don't do so that it shames me to be motivated to do it. You feel me? So a lot of times shaitan will give you this thing, oh, don't give nasiha to your brother about something you haven't mastered yet. If everyone had to master everything before we could give Nasiha, guess what? We out. And ain't nobody sitting right here. Who gonna sit here? Nobody. So the point is, don't be a hypocrite. Don't like forget yourself. Don't not care. But the point is that you should be cognizant of yourself in everything that you're doing. That was number one. And number two, he said, and I wanted to leave a sadaqa jariyah that would be there after my death. What would this book be about? Ahwal al mawta The situation of death. What is death like? Wa dhikr al-hashr. What is it like when we're gathered together? Wa nashr. And all put into groups. Wa jannah What is jannah like? What is jannah like? I love children. I love when children are like my, my, my kids' age. Because they're always like, yo, can we do this in jannah? And when we get older, we stop like getting specific on jannah. So it's just kind of like, oh, we're going to go to jannah. It's going to be It's going to be nice. But with kids, it's kind of like, can we do it? I'm like, yeah, we can. Yeah, yo. Like, they're like, can we fly? I'm like, I forgot about flying. <laughs> How did I forget about flying? That was on my to-do list. Like, you know what I mean? And, and one of the things, I'm not going to spoil it now, but one of the things that I do in, in Qalam's class of tafsir, there's a lot of verses that talk about what's happening in Jannah. And when... <laughs> And when we look at the lifestyles of the, of the who's who's, let me give an example, yo. Okay. If you are somebody of celebrities, what is an event that you never miss? Like you gotta be there. Come on, don't act, yo, 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 do I have to say it? Can we not act all pious like y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Thank you. Oscars, right? Or some other gala, whatever. What's the biggest thing you do in that event? 
That's it. You put your flyest gear on that you spent whatever on, and all you do is show. Like, if you think about it, it's pretty lame. If you really think of it, it's kind of like, that's all y'all, that's, that's the height of human achievement. Like, if I make these millions, I'm just going to walk down this red carpet with the flyest gear on, and y'all just going to take pictures of me as I turn right. I could do that at home. I do that with my wife. I'll be like, yo, come on, walk down. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Let's try it, yo. It's fun. <laughs> all right, yo. Anyways. Uh, so the point I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to say is um, when, 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 now when we talk about Jannah in the Quran, it's like, oh, their clothes are made out of this and this color. And we're kind of like, oh, that's all? I'm like, why are you so hypocritical? Like, look at what people of the dunya, the biggest achievement is being served. Y'all seen the, do, the, the servants walking around with the joint on the thing, right? He's walking around, right? And what does the Quran say? Servants walking around serving you drinks here and there. What I'm trying to say is like when you read the Quran from this perspective, it becomes alive and you realize that that lifestyle that they're trying to emulate is, is what Allah has promised on a far, uh, far better and, and more detailed manner for the people of Jannah. And so I just, I'm just trying to give you an example of when we start to read these, these verses of Jannah and Jahannam, how it really should hit home and connect to us. So what does he say? I wanted to discuss what Jannah is like. Because if you don't get specific on it, you, that motivation starts to drop, right? Cool. When, like, yo, okay, I'm sorry. Like when, when you, like, when you want something, right? When you want something from this dunya, it's the details that attract you. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it has a heart monitor that gets your this, that, and the third two. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's got lane keep and the rear view joint that beeps when it's someone. Like, the details are the thing that really get you. But when we get to Jannah, we get all amb ambiguous, just like, yeah, it's fun. It's nice. It's cool. Nah, like, read these narrations. And same, same thing when it comes to the narration of the hellfire. It's the details of it, the details of the grave, the details of death. These are the things that are really going to be those motivating things that you want to study and learn. Okay, let's keep going. He goes, so I wanted to tell everyone about death, the resurrection, the gathering, paradise, hellfire. Um, and I took all of it from the books of scholars and, and from the hadith. And I named this Kitab al This is the reminder. About what? About what will happen to the people who are dead. Uh, and everything you will experience from the first to the end. Let's go a little deeper here for a moment, yo. Yo, do the scales come before the bridge or the bridge before the scales? Oh, first of all, what's the bridge? See, okay, what's the scales? I think every Muslim knows about the scales, yo. Okay, but which one comes first? Do I cross the bridge first and then scale my deeds? Or do I scale my deeds and then cross the bridge? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up, shakes. Hold up. We'll get there. We'll get there. The point is, those details are what make you have that deep, like, appreciation and understanding. Right? And so that's what we're building right there. Like, what's after this? Then what happens? Kothar. Kothar. Kothar is where the prophet says to them, said, you will come, each one of us. Hold up. Picture it. Each one of us will walk up to the prophet and he will look you in the eye and he'll be like, yo, good job. Take a sip, yo. Take a sip. Come on, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like after, after we run those races and do hate them, be on the side like, yo, good job, bro. That water tastes great. And then, you know, for, for someone to hand it to you, that's holy kothar, right? Where does it happen? When, when does that happen? Is that before the bridge, after the bridge? This, that. You see what I'm saying? It's like we have this ambiguous knowledge of these stages, but we don't really got it all mapped out. So we're like, yeah, it's in the akhirah. Like when? Like when? What's the stage? So that's what this is about. It's about knowing that journey and understanding that journey. Sorry, I'm too hyped. Sorry, I'm going to drink some water, inshallah. It's just really exciting, inshallah. So let's go forward. He says... Then he explains the structure of the book. He says, He's like, I made after every chapter, small sub-chapters where I talk about, you know, different aspects of that 
thing that I brought up in the main chapter. Um, and then he says, and I explained the hadith because the hadith, remember the prophet at the top of that mountain looking on the other side, it's all from the Prophet Sallallahu So he's like, I explained the hadith to you because that's our actual purpose. Um, and then he says, um, Like, make this dua with me. He says, may Allah make our intentions pure. I mean, like, yo, like, why are we all here right now, this room? Like, why are we all here? Because I truly want to know about this journey of my life and my real life. Uh, Muqarriban min rahmati. May Allah make it so that this brings us closer to his mercy and his generosity. Then he says, La rabba siwahu. There is no God besides Allah. Wa la ma'buda. And there is none worthy of worship except him. All right. So, are we ready? Should we start? Like, we're going to start, right? Okay, let's start it. Bismillah. So, um, life is difficult, man. First person, y'all, picture it. Life is hard, family drama, kids not showing you love, money is whatever. And Imam is talking about moat and death and all these things. And in your heart, picture it, you, 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 you. You start thinking, man, I just want to leave this world, man. I'm tired of it, bro. Fires, you know what I mean? Like, keep switching jobs every three weeks. You know what I mean? Like, family drama. I'm tired of life, man. Just, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get out of here, man. His first chapter is this. Bab al-Nahyi an taman al-Mawt wa du'abihi li dhurrin nazala fil mali wal jasad. The chapter regarding the prohibition, you cannot ask for death or make dua for death because of some calamity that hits you in your wealth or your body. You know why I find this deep? Because as we talk about the akhirah, the hereafter, we naturally have this desire for it, right? And if that goes too far, you kind of like, yo, I don't even want to be here no more, right? If Think if that really hits you hard. You're like, yo, I'm deuces, I'm out, right? So the prophet actually taught, and now listen to this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, write these down, memorize it. لَا يَتَمَنَّيَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ الْمَوْتَ This is the Prophet's words, not Imam Qurtubi in Sahih Muslim. None of you should ever wish for death, hope for death, because of some hardship that hits you. فَإِنْ كَانَ لَا بُدْ If the circumstances are really bad, here's what you say. Allahumma ahini ma kanat al hayat khayran li. Oh Allah, give me life so long as life is good for me. Wa tawaffani idha kanat al wafat khayran li. And oh Allah, let me leave when death is better for me. Basically, like, yo, ya Allah, when you know I'm about to be slipping and tripping up for a while, let me go right before that. Right? But as long as there's good left for me to do, ya Allah, let me stay. This is beautiful. Why? Because here we are talking about death, right? We're talking about death, 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 death. And somebody, somebody walk in from off the streets like, dang, Muslims is mad, like, fatalistic, kind of like, y'all don't want to live? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, y'all ready to just bounce? Like, I see all the nice cars in the lot, so yeah, I must like living. This is the beauty. See, here's the beauty. The, the difficulty that the Muslim balances, life is beautiful and amazing. So appreciate it because of how it's Allah's blessing. But here's the crazy part. But don't get attached to it. Don't get attached to it to the point where it pulls you away from the one who gave it to you. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. Life is a blessing. It's a gift. Don't throw away God's blessing. This is, Allah gave you this moment. I'm alive. I'm breathing. Like, I'm seeing the sunset. I'm seeing my children smile. I'm, I'm meeting my brothers. These are beautiful experiences. I'm seeing my mother, my father. Beautiful moments God has given all of us. For you to just throw that away, the prophet's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. If it gets really hard, the most you can say ever is, oh, Allah, oh, Allah. Let me live as long as life, life is good for me. And Ya Allah, when it's good for me to go, let me go, Ya Allah. When it's good for me to go, let me go. So he brings this hadith and he reminds us 
Now, these are the words of Imam Qurtubi. Listen, he's pretty deep here. Qal al ulama. He says, um, the scholars state, let me explain something real quick. Let me, um, just about Islamic studies for you for a minute. So, um, the last book we studied was Imam Muhasibi. The year that Imam Muhasibi was living is in the third century of Hijrah. That means 300 years after the Prophet Sallallahu That means how many hundred years ago for us? Quick math, a thousand? More, 1100, right? The early scholars, they, people got the message quick. So they kept it concise, concise. You know how in different, okay, let's be real. Do y'all read a lot of literature? Anyone read novels? Be real, oh, y'all always faking, okay. <laughs> Anyways, so if you read novels, right? If you read like old school literature, they're like very, very thick. Jane Austen is like, like crazy, right? But today we would never read that, right? Like most novels are not gonna be that, that thing. So over time, the trends of scholars change. Why am I saying that? Here's the point. When Imam Muhasibi wrote, it was straight to the point because he's like, you get it. You don't need a lot of words. When Qurtubi comes, he's coming in the 700. That's not that long, it was 700 years ago, not 1100. So he actually explains more. And so you'll notice as we're studying this book, Imam Qurtubi talks to us a lot more and explains. Nowadays, that's all we do is explain, right? We need more and more explanation, right? So this is Imam Qurtubi talking. He says, Qal al maut Qal al ulama, Qal al maut Qal al ulama. Uh, the ulama say, Al mawtu laysa bi adamin mahdan. Philosophical heads, this is for you, all right? He goes, Death is not just mere absence, it's a thing, right? Death is not nothingness, there's something there. Al ladhi khalaq al what? He created mawt. So moat is not the absence of death. There's a thing. It's a creation, he says, which is interesting. A little philosophical stuff, whatever. It's just not non-existence. Here's what it is. What is death? It's just breaking the linkage between soul and body temporarily. Boom, breaking the linkage. That's all it is. He goes... And there's a, a barrier coming between body and soul. And then he goes, intiqal min dar ila dar. And you're actually just moving from one home to the next home. One home to the next home. As I said, one of my favorite verses is uh, subhanAllah, Surah Muhammad. Surah Muhammad. Ah, uh, subhanAllah. What is it? In the beginning of Surah Muhammad. Ta'arafaha. So you Allah says in Surah Muhammad that we will enter them into a Jannah that we've already made them know. The scholars, they, they explain that when people enter into their house, when you move into a new place, especially if it's big, you spend half the time trying to figure out where everything is. It's kind of fun sometimes, right? Where are we at right now, right? But they enter into Jannah and they already know, oh, you want the milk? Oh, we, the, the other fridge is over there on the other side, right? Oh, oh, you want the pool? Oh, we got two. Which one you want, the milk or the honey one? You know, like they already know where it is, but you've never been there before. So the idea is you're entering into a Jannah that from our perspective, we've never been there. That could seem scary. The Quran says, no, 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 no. You're going to walk in already knowing where everything is already, right? You're going to walk in already knowing. So he says, what is death? It is moving from one home to the next home. I already know where everything is. This is my spot. But just, guess what he says? He goes, but it is, a, it, is, it is definitely a difficulty. It is a calamity. It is hard. Death is hard. I told you this halakha is going to be a little heavy for us, but we got this, y'all. And he says, because Allah calls it that. He goes, فَأَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ Allah says, the calamity of death hits them. فَالْمَوْتُ هُوَ مُصِيبَةُ Al-Uzma. He goes, yo, death is the musibah. It is heavy. It is real. It ain't easy. Now, here he goes. It's heavy. It's a calamity, right? Imam Qurtz is about to hit us with something. He goes, Qala ulama'una. But our scholars say, Wa'adhamu minhu. A bigger calamity? Al-ghaflatu an wa e'aradhu an dhikrihi. Worst calamity is to be heedless of it or negligent, turning away from it. It's worse to be to not know about it, 
It's going to come. What's worse is for you to act like it's not coming. For you to pretend, pretend that it's not there. Turning away from it. Or just be heedless of it. I don't even know. He says that's a bigger calamity. Because it's coming anyway, right? Or not thinking about it enough. Or not doing actions for it. Yo, he goes, death alone will give you the lessons you need to live a righteous life. Yo, listen. Yo, when people pass away, like everybody be walking around a little different, man. You know what I'm saying? Do I have to be specific? Like everyone's like meeting each other. It's like, Salam alaikum, how you doing? Yeah, you good? Like everyone has a little different, like the pep and the step ain't there no more. It's a little different. Should I be specific? Uh, Sheikh Muhammad Sharif just passed away, right? Like you meeting people, everyone's kind of like, Salam alaikum, alaikum, salam. Because you know why? Because that death hits you and you kind of like, yo, yo, yo. I'm like, yo, I'm 39. So it changes things. It, it, so so the, the point he's trying to make here is Death alone is a lesson for you if you get that lesson enough. And he goes, he narrates a narration. Uh, it isn't a very strong narration. I'll be very clear about that. But he narrates a narration where the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, "Lo anna baha'im ta'alamuna min al maut ma ta'alamuna ma akaltum minhum saminan." He goes, "It's a weaker narration. That doesn't mean it's fake." But he says, "If the animals knew what y'all know about death, like all of us are cognizant that we're gonna die and they could come any time." He goes, "If the animals had that knowledge, you would never ever eat." Uh, animal that had any fat on it and the reason he's saying it's because it wouldn't do anything he's saying like because of its awareness of what's coming it wouldn't eat extra food right he's like but look at y'all y'all just chilling having a good time it's it's about us being not aware of that reality that stares us in the face all the time all right okay so let's go forward in his next section he says now he goes wait hold up what was the, by the way, what was the name of this chapter we just started? Come on, real quick. The name of the chapter. Y'all be sleeping on me. Too heavy. Yeah, the prohibition of asking Allah or wanting to leave the world. Right? So now he brings up something. And this is where we put our little thinking caps on for a moment. What did Maryam alayhi salatu salam say when she was giving birth to Isa? Yeah, I wish, ya laytani mitu qabla hadha. Man, I wish I was dead. Uh-oh, Quran, hadith. What do we do? I'm going to open it up to the floor. How do you understand that? Anyone? Expression? Expression? Okay. There are some scholars that, some, some sahaba that was like, man, I wish I was a blade of grass, man. So I wouldn't be judged. Right? I'll give you a hint. Come on, y'all. Think with me. What was the name of the chapter we said before? The prohibition of what? For what reason, though? A calamity and what? Keep going the whole thing. And body or wealth. Anyone got it yet, sisters? All right, let me just share it with you. Check it. The next chapter he brings is, it is allowed. He goes, this is the name of the next chapter. Jawazu temen al the permissibility of wishing to go back home. Let's put it that way. Because of a fear of your dean leaving. Like, yo, listen, I don't care what you do to me. You can take my wealth, you can mess up whatever I got, my money. But the moment I feel my dean is leaving, I don't want to be here no more. I don't, I'm done. I'm done. Why? Because the purpose of me being in this world is to know Allah. And now once the fitna gets so serious that I might lose my faith, I'll lose wealth. I'm good. Life, cool too. But faith, that's something I'm like, Ya Allah, I'm out. Take me. You feel me? Now, let's look at Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam. Imam Qurtubi says she was saying that out of a fear of deen, religion. Why? Because I'm known as a righteous woman. And I'm going to walk in the, in, the, in the town with a baby? That's going to mess up my deen. That's going to hurt me deep. Or, second way to understand it, the people that make fun of me and call me uh, 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 someone that committed zina, 
their deen is going to get messed up because of me. Either way you look at it, it's deen that Imam Qurtubi says is the reason that she's like, I just need to leave and get out of here. Ya Allah, this is so hard. The other way to look at it is as an expression. She wasn't truly asking for that, but I don't know how childbirth is, so I ain't going to front like I do, right? But yeah, you know, it was a tough moment, let's say, to say the least. Ya laytani mitu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyam mansiya. Okay, the next section. Okay, and this will be our last se uh, section for this evening, inshallah ta'ala, but it's a heavy one. So don't like lighten up, stay focused. Babu dhikrul mawt, the chapter on death now. All that was before, remember what I said? What did we say? You're laying in your bed, you're at home. Life is getting hard. Can't pay the rent, can't pay the mortgage. Kids giving me drama, they don't even love me. Parents already left. Nah, life is good. If you got iman, you got another prayer, you got another subhanAllah, life is good. You can't ever ask Allah to leave. Now he moves on to death itself. Dhikrul mawt wa fadlihi. Well, isti'adad lahu. The mention, the remem remembrance of mawt, death, and its virtue. Why is it good to remember this? Why is this class good for us? He starts off with one hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Akthiru dhikr hadim al or hadim in some narrations. Remember the thing that shifts all paradigms. Y'all know Arabic, it didn't say that. I know it didn't say that, I got you. Remember the thing that shifts all paradigms. Changes, remember the thing that changes all perspective. Remember that thing that changes all perspective. Now, what does the hadith actually say? Remember often that thing which cuts off all pleasure. But I've explained it to you with my other tr translation. It's, it's about a reminder of that thing that it makes us realize what matters and what doesn't matter. And for me, I know the hadith says it cuts off all pleasures. But in reality, for me, it makes me value every single moment that I'm experiencing and that's where the pleasure actually lies. That's where the pleasure actually lies. Let's look at a, a few more narrations. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Umar says, the Prophet ﷺ said, remember the thing, remember a lot, the thing that breaks off all pleasure. They were like, Ya Rasulullah, what are you talking about? What is that? The Prophet ﷺ said, death. In another narration, Ibn Majah says that uh, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ. We don't know who he was. He just came. He said, Salamu Alaikum. He said, Salam to the Prophet. And he was like, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, which is the best believer? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the one with the best character. He said, who's the smartest believer? Who's the sharpest tool in the toolbox? <laughs> the one that remembers death the most. And the one who's preparing for it the most during this life right now. So let's go forward. At, here's what Qurtubi says about this hadith now. He says this. Our scholars, they say, what does it mean when the Prophet says, remember that thing that, uh, that destroys all pleasures? He says, this is extremely brief and concise advice, which contains so much of a reminder for us. And it is the best reminder. He goes, whoever really sits down and thinks about them leaving, they start planning like, yo, like they start planning like, what's going to be like? Like, what's, what's my plan? He says, The present moment spoils a bit. It spoils a bit. And it stops you from focusing so far down on that, on that, uh, that timeline. He goes, but the problem is, this one statement is enough. He goes, but the problem is we're, 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 we're stuck. And our hearts are heedless. So nowadays we need a lot of reminders. This is his words, this ain't me. He, so let me explain what he's saying. Imam Qurtubi is like, yo, the prophet's hadith was enough for the book. You don't need the book. Those words are enough. 
But we need more explanation these days. We need to be motivated and, and things to be expanded. And that's what he's explaining right now. But then he goes, illa, if it wasn't for the fact of where we are spiritually, the words of the prophet and the verse, Kullu nafsin mot, are enough. That would have been good if you just thought over that. So then he goes forward. He goes, Ida thabata, it will stop after this section. Ida thabata ma dhakarnahu. If what we, since we know what we just said about this hadith, fa'alam anna dhikrul mot, he goes, remember that when you think about passing and leaving the world, it creates an awareness of a separation from this temporal place. Separation. Like you're aware that you're going to be separated. Now check this out. Y'all, I just like, bear with me. Yo, when we talk about separation, not everyone can deal with separation the same way. We, we talked in our previous class about how our connection with our parents influences our ability to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I talked about that in detail. And the, the, this here is heavy because what he's talking about is remembering death forces you to realize that you're going to have to separate from those that you love. Now, those of us that have developed a secure attachment style, we're good. We were told we loved you and we were told we were beautiful when we were little. Alhamdulillah, good. Alhamdulillah, that was my pops and my, my mom, right? We're okay with separation because we know that the people we separate from are still there on the other side when we come back later. But those of us who didn't have that, and that's many of us, many of us, the moment we think about separation, we think we're alone forever. We're alone forever. And that's why mo is so, death is so scary because it's this deep separation. For some of us, separation is hard to deal with, hard to deal with. But that's the reality of death. It is that ultimate separation from everything that you love and know. So what does he say? What tawajjah? He goes, remembering death is remembering that you will be separated from everybody that you love and know. And that you will be, it will fo 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 force you, excuse me, it will force you to focus at every moment to where you're going in the future. Here's where we get the philosophy of Qurtubi. He goes, check this. Every single one of us in this room is going through one of two states. We are either in a difficult state or we're chilling. Bills is paid, food in the fridge, everybody's good, alhamdulillah, right? You either in a tight situation emotionally, spiritually, financially, or you're in a good situation spiritually, emotionally, and all those other things, right? He goes, now look at this. If you are in a tight situation, emotionally, spiritually, whatever, he goes, remembering death makes things lighter on you. Why? Because nothing lasts forever. I'm going to be through this soon. I'm good. I'm good. I'll be through this in no time. Whenever we were running, the main thing you focus, is going to be over soon, bro. The difficult moment is made easier by the remembrance of the fact that it's going to be over soon. And so he goes, remembrance of death, if you're in a difficult situation, it reminds you it's going to be over. And you know what? I can get through it a little bit more. I can get through it a little bit more. I can get through it a little bit more. Boom. Yo. You know, um, there's this hadith, yo. There's this hadith that the person, sound, this is a strong hadith, that Allah will take the person who had the most difficult life in this dunya, unimaginable to us, guys. Like, don't even, like, whole nother level. You know, like when your kid, your little brother and sister be like, I'm hungry, you, be like, you don't even know what hunger is, yo. You know what I mean? Like, whole nother style, level of difficulty. The hadith says Allah will take that person on the day of judgment and dip them into Jannah for a second and take them out. And then ask the person, have you ever gone through any difficulty in your existence? And from that one moment of goodness, due to the amount and the qualitative aspect of that goodness, that person will say, Wallahi, I've never experienced a difficult moment in my entire life. And then Allah will take the most lavish, living up, got every car, everything, da da da, dip that person for one millisecond in the hellfire, pull them back out. Have you ever experienced any goodness in your life? The person will be like, no, I don't even know what good is. I always, that hadith always hit me. But it hit me today a little deeper. You know why? So my wife, she had me doing a DIY project. Y'all know what that is? You know what I mean? All right, cool. So uh, it came out great. 
I did good, y'all. So, um, you know, after it was done and it's all fixed up, I walk in the room and I sit on the couch and I'm like, I will lie. I said, I'm not joking. I was like, I can't even remember what it looked like before. You ever been in a situation like, you know what I mean? I can't even remember what it looked like before. And immediately that hadith hit me. And that's a little upgrade. A little, I just built a bookshelf, y'all. <laughs> I ain't even paint the room. I just built a bookshelf. And I'm all of a sudden, I'm like, dang, I can't even remember what this area looked like before. And immediately that hadith hit me. It's like, that goodness is so good that all of that is lost. All of that is gone. So what he's saying here is, is beautiful because he's like, if you're going through hardship right now, the remembrance of death is like, yo, I'll be good. It's over soon. What if, what if we chilling though? And that's all of us in the room. Low key, low key. What does he say? Check this. He goes, you're in a situation of goodness. Si'a. Si'a means everything's wide open. It's good. Remembering death stops you from getting deluded. Oh, I'm made. Yo, I got it. I'm this. I'm that. That one thought of death is like, yo, I ain't even gonna have this, yo. I ain't even gonna have this. For real. I can't even take it with me, yo. And then we block it all like, yeah, whatever. Right, but keep going, though. It's all good. But that thought stops you. It brings you down. And what does he say? sukun ilayha. And it stops you. This is the biggest thing. It stops you from depending upon that thing for tranquility. Because you know it's going to leave. You need to say that to yourself again. You're living in that beautiful house. You got that nice car. All this beautiful stuff. The thought of you leaving reminds you that this thing is going to be separated from you. So you know what? That ain't my source of happiness because I'm going to lose it one day. Thinking about that is so therapeutic for us. Because then you're, you're forced to say, well, what will stay with me the whole time? Good actions and Allah. That's it. So let me start leaning on those. We're almost done. Uh, he goes, this is his words. al ummah. Everybody knows that death doesn't have a set year. Allahu Akbar. It doesn't have a set time. There's no one sickness it comes from. It comes with no sickness. And it's crazy we read in this right now, man. Why? Why did God make it in this way? So you always on guard. You always on guard. I'm always ready. Why? Because who knows? Musta'idan li dhalika. He goes, I love these stories. Imam Kortavi goes, we're going to end with this one. Imam Kortavi goes, y'all should know when I say end, that means there's like two more ends with this one and then we end. All right, cool. All right. No, for real, for real. So he goes, wakana ba'du salihin. This is heavy. There was one righteous man. Yunadi bil layl. He used to go up on the, uh, the Surah al Madina, the wall of the city. Old school days, the city had that wall around it. Y'all seen the movies, they gotta like open the door, let somebody in. All right, cool. So he used to go up on the wall and he would yell out, Ar Rahil, Ar Rahil. Now in Arabic, Rahil means it's time to go. It's time to go. So every night, this righteous man, and everybody knew him, they probably thought he was crazy. He would go up on the wall of the city. And he would yell out, it's time to go. It's time to go. Kind of crazy, right? So look what happened. He died. The leader of the city, that a night time came and nobody yelled out. So he's like, yo, where's, uh, where's, uh, where's old man that used to call out Rahil? They're like, yo, he passed away last night. And he started to recite this poetry. I tried to put the poetry in English and make it flow. That's my man's job. Where he at, yo? That's yo. Uh, he ain't here. We got to get him to come through. I'm not good with the bars. I tried my best. So I'll just translate it. He goes, Mazala yal haju bil rahil wa dhikri. He goes, My man used to always say it's time to go. 
Hatta anakhu bibabihi al Until all the camels were at his door. You know what I thought about? For y'all with little brothers and sisters or kids, whenever it's time to go, you got to yell out it's time to go like 20 minutes before it's time to go. And finally, when you say it's time to go, finally everybody got their shoes on and they're at the door. You feel me? You can imagine it. So he's saying that this man kept saying it's time to go, it's time to go until everybody is at the door with their shoes on. So it's metaphor now. It's pure metaphor. So then he goes, فَأَصَابَهُ مُتَيَقِّذًا مُتَشَمِّرًا ذَا أُحْبَتٍ So death came to him. He already had his shoes on. He already had his shoes on. Who? The man that was on the, on the, on the wall saying every day, yo, we got to go, we got to go. The point is, man, it's heavy. The point is, you know, that's the end of the poem. Uh, the point is the remembrance of the death of death is the thing that's going to uh, motivate us. It's going to keep us focused in the moment. And it's something that really, really uh, guides us. Um, and I think that's it, inshallah ta'ala, for today. Ah, last thing. I told you, I get three more. But this is for real the last one. Qala laffaf. Man akthara, what do you get from remembering death abundantly? He goes, look. Man akthara dhikrul mawt. Whoever remembers death regularly, your death, I'm leaving, you will be blessed with three things. Three things. Number one, I highly recommend you note these down. Ta'jila toba. You do toba quicker. What does toba mean? Like repentance. When you, when you think about death regularly, like, yo, I might not wake up in the morning. You're like, yo, let me do some toba real quick. You know what I mean? I told y'all many halakas ago, I'm weird, yo. Sometimes when I drive through an intersection... I'm weird. I maybe watch too many flicks or whatever. When I drive through the intersection, I get this thought like, what if there could be a car coming, right? So before I get to any intersection, I'm kind of like, stop for a lot, stop for a lot, stop for a lot, stop for a lot. It's kind of weird. I'm weird. Okay, whatever. All right, call me weird. But the point is, like, I ain't trying to be caught off guard. So the idea is when you realize it could come any moment, you start to do toba more frequently and not put it off because, yo, it's, this might be it. Number one. Number two. You good. You become complacent, not complacent, content with what you got. And that's a whole from last halakha. You become content with what you have. You're good. Like, I'm all right. I don't need no more. Why? Yo, I, I, I'm almost out, yo. I'm almost out. I'm going to dip in a little bit. Number three. Nishat al-ibadati. You find more energy in your worship. You know, some days you'd be mad, lazy to read Quran or pray. Those are the days you got to be like, yo, this might be my last day. You can be like, yo, hold up. Let me knock this out real quick. Right? Why? Because it might be my last day, my last opportunity. Let me knock this out real quick. And then he goes, whoever, it's the opposite, obviously the opposite. He goes, whoever does not remember death regularly is afflicted with three things. It's the exact opposite. Tasweefa Toba. They keep putting off Toba. Yo, I'll do Toba next year. When I turn 32, I'm going to do Toba. That's going to be my big Toba. I'm going to go for Umrah with Murphy, and it's going to be nice. <laughs> I'm going to get my real Toba in, right? If A and J there too, it's over now. I'm good, right? No, yo, you don't know what's coming. Habibi, tonight might be that night. This is surreal talking about this, right, Adam? Like, this is surreal because we just, subhanAllah, man. Allah, man. Number two, tarqur radha bil kafaf. You just want more and more. Second effect, you forget death. You want more and more. I need more. I need more. I need more. I need more. And number three, and this may be a cure for us. Ibadah, you become lazy in it. It gets heavy. Oh, oh. You know what I mean? Ibadah becomes heavy on you. So I think this is a beautiful place for us to end, inshallah ta'ala. Um, this is the beginning of the journey. We haven't even begun. He's just remembering. He's just talking about the benefit of remembering death. He's not even describing death yet. So low key, the journey hasn't begun yet. We'll begin the journey, inshallah, next Wednesday, inshallah. Uh, may Allah allow us to benefit from whatever we have learned. Um, may Allah allow us to be of those people who remember death regularly. 
Uh, may Allah allow us to be of those people who value the moment that we are in and see the infinite potential that lies in the moments that we are experiencing. May Allah allow us to be like that man that was on the, the wall of the city that kept saying, it's time to go, it's time to go. And may Allah make us like him in the sense that we are ready when it is time to go. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ila illa ant, nastaghfiq wa atubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaneen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. All right, jazakallah khair, everyone. As-salamu alaykum.